let's speak about strategies and heuristics for improving the safety of AI systems in the farther future. The overall goal in making AI systems safer in the farther future is to shape the process that will lead to these advanced AI systems and steer that process in a safer direction. To realize that goal, we'll first describe various impact strategies, and then we'll describe an important caveat, that is the safety capabilities balance, which needs to be kept in mind when trying to have impacts on the development of AI systems. Let's now turn to various impact strategies. One strategy is to study microcosms and subproblems. So a microcosm is a problem that mirrors properties of later stage harder problems. They're not maximally realistic problems though. These microcosms are more tractable because they make some simplification assumptions and they're intentionally not fully realistic for the sake of tractability. So if the microcosm is solved or made practically no longer a problem, that's not to say that the larger version of the problem is solved. However, nonetheless, we've certainly made progress on the larger version of the problem. So it's important not to confuse the microcosms with the fuller version of the problem. But to make progress, we often need to tackle a subproblem. It's also the case that microcosms are amenable to empirical feedback loops, which have many associated benefits, such as progress can be measured. When there are empirical measurements, we can actually understand the phenomena rather than just gesture at it. This avoids a lot of confusion and makes it clear whether we're actually working on the problem. It's then also the case that iterative progress is possible. Consequently, since many accumulated changes can give rise to something highly useful, no strokes of genius are necessary to solve the problem. When there are empirical feedback loops, there's often a lot of information to be gained, and the value of information can be especially high if it's achieved early on. It can tell one to pivot and potentially work on a different problem, or can identify that a problem is highly intractable or that some are actually easier than expected. This is possible with empirical feedback loops. When there are empirical feedback loops, self-deception is also a lot less likely. Often people want a specific strategy to be important, or a specific skill that they have to crack open the problem, but it may not actually be the tool necessary for the job. When there are empirical feedback loops, this disconfirming evidence is much harder to avoid. If the method doesn't work, well, that's flatly measured. There's no escaping it. One's ideas can then be called much more quickly with empirical feedback loops. This allows us to search large solution spaces far more quickly because we can cull so many ideas so rapidly. It's also the case that bottom-up tinkering becomes possible. Many of the crucial variables are found by accident, and so there's a lot of information to be gained by bottom-up tinkering, and that's possible with empirical feedback loops. So empirical feedback loops have many different benefits. I like to emphasize again the iterative progress is possible, though, as one of the main ones. One might think that, well, you're just doing some small iterations. This isn't large steps. I should note that many complex systems have uh, been generated by evolution. For example, humans have been generated by evolution, and likewise their eye. It's not the case that complex structures need top-down design to work. Often through many stages of iteration, very complicated, highly intricate performance structures can evolve. Another strategy is to perform research to improve epistemics and improve safety culture. Research can help us better understand the problem, and so that can improve epistemics, and research can also help us identify dead ends. So even if it doesn't ultimately solve the problem, the dead ends can still be very valuable. This better understanding can lead to concretized research goals, which can direct research scalably. If there's a concrete research goal, many people can jump on the problem and start working on it. It's not something that needs uh, high fidelity, complex understanding to work on. It's mainly push up that metric. Scalable, interesting research problems can also change behavioral precedents, which is a component of safety culture. Now, this isn't to say that behavioral precedents buy everything if one's trying to have impact. One also needs high or shared high level goals and other properties like they need to be concerned about systemic risks. Uh, if we're going to try to really reduce risks. 
safety culture is quite an important variable to improve, and research is a way to do it. Safety culture is, after all, as noted earlier in the course, the most important factor to fix if we want to prevent future accidents. Another strategy for improving the safety of long-term systems is to try to build safety in early. As an example of a system that didn't do this is the internet. The internet protocols were not designed with security in mind, and this has led to easily avoidable but embedded and enduring security weaknesses that have cost the economy tremendous amounts of money. Had we had a more proactive approach towards security in the past, this could have easily been avoided. Another example of building safety in earlier of the importance of it is mentioned by a Department of Defense report, which says that approximately three fourths of safety critical decisions occur early on in a system's development. Consequently, if we're wanting to influence the safety of a system, we'll need to try to build safety in early as opposed to later. It's also the case that we can't just search for safety features that are only applicable to strong AI, because at some point strong AI will emerge and it may be too late to integrate those features in. It might be too costly or it may not be politically viable. However, when there are fewer constraints on the system, it may be possible to build those safety features in earlier. Also, trying to just design techniques to make strong AI safe but, but don't have any relation to current AI systems it is problematic for some other reasons. Trying to retrofit safety features late in development increases safety costs, or the costs may be so high or so infeasible that they may not be included at all. So one can't just try and think about how am I going to make some hyper-advanced system safer? We need to think about how to make current systems safer as well. A generic strategy for improving the safety of long-term AI systems is to increase the cost of adversarial behavior. One might try and have humans increase the cost of this sort of behavior, but in the long term, a possibility is to use other strong but focused AI systems to regulate and guard against malicious behavior and agents. This is in contrast to relying exclusively on humans to regulate them. So perhaps AI systems could empower us to rein in undesirable malicious behavior. Increasing the costs of adversarial behavior requires that we assiduously remove model vulnerabilities. So this isn't something that we wait to do at the last minute. And increasing the costs of adversaries makes them less likely to attack, makes their attack less potent, or can impel them to behave more desirably. So if we increase adversarial costs, that could reduce the impact of their attack, or it could reduce the probability of their attack in the first place. If that probability is sufficiently small, then it, the probability for other actions would increase, and that could impel them to, desire, to behave more desirably. I'm proposing here thinking about getting systems to be safer with a cost-benefit-based perspective. This is actually fairly commonly used in adversarial situations. In the cybersecurity communities and in warfare, people think in terms of cost and benefits. They're not thinking about trying to eliminate risk entirely. They're trying to increase the cost of adversarial behaviors because that's what's actually tractable. Losing nobody in war isn't possible, but there are certainly more wise moves that can reduce the cost of warfare. And likewise, there aren't completely perfect computer systems. However, there are some vulnerabilities that are far more critical than others. This is how a cost-benefit cost perspective can be useful for thinking about longer-term AI risks, rather than thinking that it's an all-or-nothing property as to whether or not a system will be safe. Another strategy to influence long-term AI systems development is to prepare for crises. Here's a quote. Only a crisis, actual perceived, produces real change. When that crisis occurs, the actions that are taken depend on the ideas that are lying around. That, I believe, is our basic function, to develop alternatives to keep them alive and available until the politically impossible becomes the politically inevitable. So the impact of individual choices can be highly evident during crises. It's a very volatile period. So during a time of crisis, it could be set in a far safer direction if we prepare early and can offer simple, viable, time-tested proposals. Consequently, again, we can't just swoop in at the last minute to try to make systems safe. We'll need to come up with techniques that are viable and easily implementable for policymakers when a crisis arises. 
in trying to improve the safety of long-term systems, people should act today. However, when they're doing so, they need to keep in mind the safety capabilities balance to minimize unintended consequences. Before getting into the safety capabilities balance, let's preliminarily note that intelligence can harm safety or it could help safety. For example, if a model is made more intelligent, it could certainly be directed to be safer. That's quite conceivable. Yet, a model that is more intelligent also has a higher potential of performing unsafe actions or that more intelligent model could be used more destructively. The implication is that intelligence cuts both ways. Intelligence is not good necessarily, and it's not bad necessarily, all things considered. It is a fairly complex relation with safety. Now, although intelligence and safety are related, that doesn't mean they're inextricably linked. An agent that is knowledgeable, inquisitive, quick-witted, and rigorous is not necessarily honest, just, power-versed, or kind. So many safety-relevant attributes are not guaranteed by high intelligence. There's a distinction between intellectual virtues of a system and moral virtues of a system. So one might think to improve safety, what we should do is we should try to just improve some safety metric. We'll have some desirable behavior, and then we'll try to make it exhibit that behavior more frequently. But we couldn't try increasing safety by making systems fail less, but then systems would also be more competent, which would hasten the onset of X risks. So it's not necessarily the case that you want them to perform undesirable actions at a lower frequency. And I should note, it can be genuinely difficult to disentangle safety from capabilities. Here's some examples of capabilities affecting safety goals. The ability to optimize over longer time horizons will help agents accomplish more difficult goals, but this could also make agents act more prudently and avoid taking irreversible actions, which are things that could potentially make the system safer. So here's capabilities affecting safety goals. As another example, pre-training and self-supervised learning make models more accurate, but also improves various robustness and uncertainty goals too. So again, we see a complex relationship. Improving world understanding helps models anticipate consequences, but this can also help them be less likely to spawn unforeseen consequences, which is another safety goal. So we can see safety goals may be increased by improving capabilities. Here are some examples of safety goals improving capabilities. If one encourages models to be truthful and not assert falsehoods, that could increase capabilities. That's because truthfulness combines accuracy, calibration, and honesty. So if one is trying to improve truthfulness, they might actually just be trying to improve the accuracy of the model, which would improve its general capabilities, of course. So if we're trying to optimize truthfulness, we might be incentivizing people to optimize accuracy, and we should instead encourage people to optimize things that are more safety relevant, more purely safety relevant, namely calibration and honesty. As another example, reinforcement learning done with task comparisons, like with InstructGPT, increases code generation capabilities. So while people may have used reinforcement learning to try and model quote unquote human intentions, um, which are largely just task preferences of some sort, this can be used to increase capabilities, such as code generation capabilities, and that we would call a capabilities externality. Given this complex relation, how should safety relate to capabilities? Well, I would argue that a research effort at scale needs to be precautious and avoid advancing general capabilities in the name of safety. Now, what do I mean by a general capability? It could be various things. It could be general prediction, classification, state estimation, efficiency, scalability, generation, data compression due to minimum description length principle, executing clear instructions, helpfulness, informativeness, reasoning, planning, researching, optimization, supervised learning, self-supervised learning, sequential decision-making, recursive self-improvement, open-ended goals, models accessing the internet, or similar capabilities. Now, we're not talking about applications here. Those aren't necessarily as general, and they tend to be more downstream. I should also say, this isn't an exhaustive list of all potential general capabilities, but hopefully this gives a sense of 
the typical goals of machine learning research, and we want to move beyond that. We want to move progress in a safer direction than it would have been otherwise. So now let's speak about the safety capabilities balance and capabilities externalities. To reduce total risk, rather than reducing risk on one dimension by increasing risk on another dimension, we need constrained optimization. That is, to avoid trying to improve a safety metric by also improving uh, general capabilities, which will have a very mixed effect on safety, we should try and just move in the safety direction. We suggest that researchers improve, the, improve safety relative to capabilities and improve the balance between safety and general capabilities. To be even more precautionary, we could advise that safety research aim for minimal capabilities externalities. Now, I'll acknowledge externalities are not always known ahead of time. It's not always obvious what the externalities of research area will be before the research has started. Before that, we're just relying on intuition, and we know that intuition doesn't always work that well with deep learning. So consequently, continual reassessment and monitoring of externalities is necessary, and if needed, one could curtail research in areas where externalities are hard to avoid. It's not that difficult to control capabilities externalities. Research contributions could aim to come up with methods that are approximately orthogonal to capabilities measures. There are many papers written on this. I've written several. Here's an example of how capabilities can be disentangled from safety. So there are some capabilities methods that might just move along the trend line, and there are some safety methods that might distinctly improve the safety metric. That tends to be more valuable for improving the safety capabilities balance. So the procedure is simple. Just show an improvement on some safety metric, such as, say, adversarial robustness or an anomaly detection metric or a safe exploration metric, and then show the improvement has minimal capabilities externalities. For instance, look at the C4100 accuracy or the Atari reward. And if the method doesn't have a good safety improvement relative to the capabilities improvement, then that's probably not actually a safety contribution. In conclusion, many works claim to make systems safer, but they do so as a consequence of increasing capabilities which has a fairly mixed effect on safety. It could either harm or help it. This decreases risk by increasing the onset of X risks if they're just improving capabilities and hoping that safety is improved as a downstream consequence of it. Going forward, we should require that safety work at least improve the safety capabilities ratio and not just to move along the trend line. And to be more precautionary, we could be more strict in requiring an improved balance and also insist on minimal capabilities externalities.